This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 115, the fourth part of the Ultra Running Stranger Things series. This episode will share the amazing story of Steve Brody, a 17-year-old who excelled in ultra running in 1879, but it all came crumbling down. He was also credited as being the first to jump off the Brooklyn Bridge and live to tell about it. The 19th century ultra runner was a different breed of athlete compared to those who participate in the sport today. A large number of those runners were not necessarily the most outstanding citizens. For the vast majority, the motivation for participating was not to see what they could personally accomplish running long distances. They were primarily motivated by greed and gaining fame. It should not be too surprising that many were involved in wild, free-spending lifestyles, scandals, illegal activities, and run-ins with the law. A pattern emerged for many of the most successful ultra-runners of the 1800s. They would quickly gain fame and build up a massive fortune only to come crashing down a few years later through their own mismanagement, dishonesty, and huge egos. In this episode, the story of Steve Brody of New York City is a case study of one who gained fame and fortune multiple times, treated many people terribly along the way, and used fraud to revive his fame. The American vernacular term doing a Brody, meaning taking a bad risk or experiencing a complete failure or flop, came about because of this Steve Brody, the New York newsboy pedestrian. Stephen Brody was the son of Richard and Mary Brody of New York City. Richard was a member of the Bowery Boys street gang that menaced the city in the Bowery neighborhood in Lower Manhattan. The Bowery, the Bowery, they say such things and they do strange things on the Bowery, the Bowery, I'll never go there anymore. The Bowery Boy gang was an anti-Catholic, anti-Irish, and a somewhat criminal gang. The uniform of a Bowery boy generally consisted of a stovepipe hat and dark pants tucked into boots. Richard was murdered shortly after Steve was born in 1861. He was the youngest of seven children. Instead of attending school, Steve worked as a child selling newspapers starting at the age of six. His older brothers constantly beat him and took his hard-earned money. At age nine, he moved out of his poverty-stricken home and moved into a boy's home, and later went to live in a newsboy lodging house. Greg Young shares more about Brody on his Bowery Boys podcast. Now, when Steve was just nine years old, he moved out of his home and into special housing for boys on the street. First at a boy's home on Park Place, and then when he was around 13 years old, relocating to the Newsboys Lodging House on Duane Street. For just 18 cents a night, a child with a job could secure himself lodging, meals, and a small locker for his possessions. And this was how young Steve Brody lived for the next several years. But living in these kinds of communities, you were often living with your direct competition, and that could be tough. You had to sell newspapers every day through snow or sweltering heat, or else you risked becoming homeless. You fought for street corners, and you fought to protect your property. Men robbed the boys, and older boys robbed the younger boys. In February 1879, at the age of 17, Brody made his first attempt to break into the sport of pedestrianism. The New York Daily Herald took notice. Pedestrianism has wrought its way into the favor of the upper circles of newsboydom, as was proven last evening by the commencement of the feat proposed by Master Stephen Brody of walking 90 miles in 24 hours. The sawdust track of more than 20 laps to a mile was laid down in the gymnasium of the newsboy's lodging home in New Chambers Street and duly measured. 
Brody felt ready, but had only trained by occasionally walking from the Newsboys Lodge to McCombs Dam Bridge over the Harlem River, a distance of about nine miles. Brody's walk began at 7 p.m. on February 16, 1879. His first mile was completed in nine minutes, and he reached five miles in 52 minutes. Two other newsboys did their best to keep track of the laps. During the night, as typical with rookie ultra runners, he experienced his first trouble with nausea, requiring him to rest. He had been walking since the start in a pair of heavy, thick, soiled brogans, and at 5 a.m. took them off and walked the rest of his journey in stocking feet. He reached his 90-mile goal in 23 hours, 20 minutes, and then went off to bed. The feat has started the pedestrian fever among the newsboys, and a number commenced training, walking round the floor in the reading room. Brody quickly became a youthful pedestrian star in New York City. Next, in early March 1879, still age 17, he attempted to walk 250 miles in 75 hours at the 5th Regiment Armory, a site of many ultra events that year. He didn't succeed, but he also didn't give up. A couple of weeks later, he walked 50 miles in 8 hours, 39 minutes, in front of 3,000 people at Eagle Hall in Hoboken, New Jersey. With this success, Brody was accepted to compete in the American Championship Belt six-day race at Gilmore's Garden, soon to be renamed Madison Square Garden, in New York City with 40 runners. Because of his youth, he was a fan favorite and surprised the crowd of thousands with his bravery and received many floral gifts. Early on, he said with a grin, I'm feeling bowly and will do my best. He ran close to the front runners, but started to look lame after the first day. Brody the newsboy was in the picture of distress, and notwithstanding the opinion of his attendants that he was tough and all right, it was evident that only their ignorance and his own pluck kept him moving around the track. He found his groove and continued strong. The common joke people yelled at the newsboy was, Are they getting out any new extras? His gait was described. A very slouchy manner, with his head hanging forward and his arms swinging violently. By day three, the youngster was astonishing everyone. He was a hero to all New York City newsboys. Shivering newsboys, wet to the skin, stood in the hall shelter of the building outside, inquiring eagerly of people whom they supposed had just come from inside. How is Steve Brody getting along? By the final day, it was said that he was in the best condition of any of the eight runners who remained on the track. Brody time and time again ran amid the cheers of the crowd. He smartly would run around the track carrying a bundle of newspapers, which he autographed and sold to the spectators at exorbitant prices. His friends solicited newspaper subscriptions for him in the crowds. For his six-day debut, he finished in a very surprising seventh place with 375 miles and then immediately started to issue challenges to elite pedestrians. Brody only had a short rest and a week later competed in another six-day race in Philadelphia's concert hall against four others. He took the early lead. The newsboy, a little black-headed fellow, reminding one as he bobs around with his head bent forward of a small rat terrier. He digs along on a rapid walk for a while, and when he will fall back and plod along slowly till about the time when everybody is looking for him to retire or rest, when he astonishes all by breaking out on a dog trot, shooting past all his competitors and keeping up with the run for several miles. On day three, Brody had the lead with 208 miles. With that lead, he started to use the strategy to dog the heels of his next competitor, Henry Lyons, who was 13 miles behind. This made Lyons angry. He grumbles and growls, and at one time stopped short to allow the newsboy to pass. Brody, however, did not care to be in the lead, and stopped also, compelling Lyons to go ahead. 
This created plenty of fun, and the crowd kept continually cheering one or the other of the pair. By day five, Brody had extended his lead to a commanding 50 miles. Lyons dropped to third place, quote, due to his own surly disposition and ill temper. Lyons would stop on the track and jaw with the crowd, scolding them for applauding the newsboy. Brody also had a bad temper when he punched Lyons in the eye during an argument. In the end, Brody won with 390 miles, 82 miles ahead of the next runner. He won $500 valued at $14,800 today, a huge fortune for a young newsboy. Brody continued to seek out pedestrian opportunities for fast winnings. At the end of May 1879, he raced for 27 hours against two others at the concert hall in Philadelphia for $750. He took the early lead. But when midnight arrived, it was obvious to the spectators that some collusion was taking place with Brody and John J. Dickinson, agreeing to take long rests at the same time rather than really competing against each other. Dickinson's trainer was so disgusted that he threatened to quit, but Dickinson refused to be on the track without Brody. In the sporting parlance, it was a put-up job between Brody and Dickinson that they should come out even in the finish and divide the gate money. Dickinson, however, broke down at 64 miles. Brody did win with 95 miles. This event raised a sure red flag regarding Brody's lack of integrity. With his tail somewhat between his legs, because of a string of losses, Brody headed for California, hoping to compete against Frank Edwards, the recent winner of the Diamond Belt six-day race with 371 miles. Edwards refused to accept Brody's challenge, so the newsboy was left to find a venue and an event for him to attract interest in watching him run. He chose to attempt to cover 250 miles in 75 hours in Platts Hall in San Francisco. He failed again to reach his promised goal, reaching 223 miles. Brody next entered a six-day race at San Francisco's Mechanics Pavilion against horses and riders. Five runners competed against six horses on a 12-foot wide track. Each horse had to be ridden by only one man the entire distance. Brody boasted that he would reach more than 400 miles. The unique contest attracted thousands of spectators on the opening night, October 15, 1879. Pinafore, a gray gelding of eight years, was the favorite horse ridden by John Levy. Brody and Gus Guillermo took the early lead. The newsboy and the Spaniard are the only walkers who stand a chance of scoring more miles than the horses. Brody challenged Controller's driver to a race, which was accepted and man and horse ran around together twice, the horse passing Brody on the straight stretch and Brody gaining on the turns. Controller won the sprint. Brody reached 100 miles in 23 hours 13 minutes. By the third day, betting turned against Brody, predicting that he would not accomplish 400 miles, and Pinafore had a 51-mile lead over the runners. But then it happened. The ladies were out last night in large numbers, and we are particularly vexed that the boy Brody, who seemed to be their favorite, should have taken it on himself to gratuitously insult them by his loud mouthed obscenity and blasphemy. Mr. Brody must bear in mind that he is not in the low bowery haunt, but in a place where managers, by the exertion of care and judgment, have made, for the time being, a favorite resort for ladies. The repetition of such conduct would have a disastrous effect on the success of any future exhibitions of pedestrianism. Brody had been annoyed by a crowd of men who leaned over the rail trash-talking him as he ran by. But then he passed that annoyance on to Guillermo by passing him, stopping, and purposely dodging in front of him as he came by to make him stumble. 
The crowd then really came down on Brody, and he replied with vulgarity. Many men yelled at him for his New York language. The hostilities towards Brody and his vulgarity increased in, quote, confusion and uproar. Finally, a policeman threatened to get a warrant for his arrest if Brody didn't stop. He marched out of the building and came back and arrested Brody for his vulgar language. He had to post $50 bail to be able to continue racing. By the fourth day, Brody reached 270 miles, but was far behind his goal and behind Guillermo, who reached 300 miles. In the end, Pinafore won with 557 miles. Brody was second among the runners, with a relative meager 262 miles to Guillermo's 375. Brody failed to appear in court, forfeited that $50 in bail, and quickly left town. Loser. It was obvious that his very short, successful pedestrian career of eight months was crumbling around him like a house of cards. The immature 17-year-old clearly didn't have mature, experienced men around him to keep his temper in check and work on his public relations. On his return to New York City the next month, the hot-headed boy was arrested again. He and two companions became ruly at a restaurant. They were ordered to leave. They refused and began a general assault on the waiters and threw a can of mustard over the proprietor. <laughs> at their trial, they were each fined ten dollars. Brody's running abilities faded, but his ability to get in trouble continued. In February 1880, Brody tried to revive his pedestrian career by competing in a big six-day race, 12 hours per day, at the Music Hall in Boston, Massachusetts. His first 12 hours were pathetic, reaching only 23 miles. He was referred to by the press as a lame duck and quickly withdrew in embarrassment. Brody's brief pedestrian career was over. He had accumulated $6,000 in winnings, valued at $175,000 today. He married a wife, Bridget Breen, the daughter of a bankrupt steamship captain, started a family, but quickly lost his fortune gambling on horses. Brody also took up other jobs. He was briefly a streetcar conductor, and for a time, he even took up another foot-related profession boot blacking, hiring newly arrived Italian immigrants to man a series of boot black stands throughout the city. But Steve Brody was still a Bowery boy at heart, and who knows what his wife thought of his nightly carousing with his rowdy brothers, not to mention his frequent trips to the racetrack to bet away his weekly earnings. In 1883, Brody was back in court and fined $300 for assaulting his brother Dan in, quote, a fight with some dull instrument. Three years later, his two brothers got in a fight, were arrested and taken before the court. Brody attended, and when his brother Dan saw him, he threatened to crush Steve's skull. The judge heard that and sent Dan to prison for six months. Yes, they were a loving family. A couple months later, Brody was shot during a fight on the street by George Floyd, a printer. The wound was not serious. Brody was in a down spiral and needed to find a way to get fame. Heaven looks at you from the Brooklyn Bridge. After 14 years of construction, the Brooklyn Bridge was completed in 1883. It took 14 years the modern equivalent of over $400 million, and the life's work of three different Roeblings. But when the Brooklyn Bridge finally opened on May 24, 1883, its splendor was undeniable. Brody had witnessed the construction for years. An idea came to him how he could use the bridge to bring back his fame and fortune. Robert Emmett Odlum was a swimming instructor and daredevil. He announced that he would make a leap off the Brooklyn Bridge. On the day of Odlin's jump, the 19th of May, 1885, the police were out in force. They did not want to see Odlin jump, fearing for his life. 
and to be honest, to stop others from trying the same stunt. Thousands of citizens showed up to watch. A man in a bathing costume appeared on the bridge. The police swarmed the individual. Meanwhile, Odlum approached the railing of the bridge while the imposter held the attention of the police. He raised one hand above his head and jumped. His outraised hand was used as a rudder to maintain a vertical position. The jump started well, but something happened about a hundred feet above the water, causing Odlum to twist. Some thought it was a wind gust, or maybe a miscalculation by Odlum. He hit the water on his side. Water rose high into the air. The force of the landing rendered him unconscious. A friend in a small boat dove in to rescue him. Odlum was pulled into the small boat, briefly regaining consciousness. He asked if he had done well. Those were the last words he ever spoke. A few months later, in 1886, Brody got the idea that he could make a successful jump. You see that bridge? Well, I taught about it lots of times, looking at it out of my window. They call it the eighth wonder of the world. People come from everywhere just to look at it. If a guy jumped off that bridge, the whole world would know about it. You, you mean you jump off from the Brooklyn Bridge? Why not? You said you wanted something spectacular, didn't you? Yes, but you couldn't do that and live, could you? Well, you can't aim a saloon after a dead man, can you? We want to get our lager planted down here, but it isn't worth killing a man to do it. Leave it to me, Mr. Herman. I'll take the chance. For two weeks, he had the big bridge in his head and planned to make the jump even if it would cost him his life. He first practiced jumping off High Bridge into the Harlem River and even informed sports editors of his intentions. On the big day, July 23, 1886, Brody first met with reporters to let them take pictures and ask questions, and then he went with his friends in a wagon to the bridge. When the wagon had gone past the large granite bridge tower, it was said that he slipped off his jacket, flung it in the face of his companions, and leapt into the roadway. Climbing hand over hand down the outside iron railing like a monkey, he clambered down to the bottom of the iron structure. Then he reached down and took hold of the truss cables under the bridge. He swung by both hands free in the air. The boat containing his friends was in the middle of the river. A shriek went up from somebody on the dock below. Then Brody let go. He fell feet first and disappeared into the water into a fountain of spray. The boat arrived as Brody appeared on the surface. He made a feeble signal for assistance and then began to swim toward the boat. He was taken ashore, drank two glasses of whiskey, offered to dance a hornpipe, and threatened to thrash a policeman. He was locked up in the Oak Street Station, arraigned in police court while very drunk, and sent to a cell for the night. He was charged with attempted suicide and held for physical and psychiatric examination. Curiously, there was no significant bruises on his body, only a scrape from being brought into the boat. He boasted that he could jump off anything on earth. Was the reported story the truth? Brody had previous history of lies and deception. The newspapers mostly believed the story and made Brody the most famous person in America that year. Some skeptics claimed that Brody had a friend toss a dummy off the bridge while he was under a nearby pier, then swam out when the rescue boat approached. In David McCulloch's book about the famed Brooklyn Bridge, he expressed the belief that the jump was a hoax. It was said of Brody, Ever since he laid down his tights in Madison Square Garden and listened to the waves of applause washing against the four walls, Brody had been famishing for notoriety. His principal occupation consisted of lounging about the street. He traveled around various cities for a time, doing stunts and telling his story in dime museums until those opportunities dried up. In 1887, he opened a saloon in New York City's Bowery District with a museum about his jump. He was no longer the newsboy. 
He was now Steve Brody, bridge jumper. Now this very handsome two-story generally at 114 Bowery was really one of New York's first theme bars or theme restaurants. And the theme was Steve Brody. Behind the bar was an elaborate oil painting depicting Brody bravely hurling off the bridge, along with a signed affidavit from the boat captain who fished him out of the water. The floor of the bar was inlaid with silver dollars to give it that luxe feeling, that luxurious feeling. As though After many other claims of jumping off bridges, in 1889, Brody claimed that he had gone over Niagara Falls in a rubber suit. He produced a 1,500-word version of his story that was printed in the New York Sun. But reporters finally became skeptical and realized that only three hand-picked New York men were the ones who claimed to see him go over the falls. This faking business has ceased to be even amusing. People who were on the Maid of Mist gave a different story, seeing men hiding in the bushes, faking the entire thing, putting a man into a wagon in a blanket. Finally, the Buffalo Evening News pointed out that the entire detailed story came from Ernest Gerard who had a reputation of reporting outlandish stories to sell newspapers and later became a fiction writer. In the past, newspapers had printed stories that came directly from Brody and assumed the daring accomplishments were true. His story has been corroborated again and again by his own hired men who were with him in the dark and misty hours of the morning. He has never, in any of his wonderful alleged performances, timed the feats so that newspaper reporters could be present. Later in 1890, it was reported that Brody admitted to throwing a large dummy over the falls, and later news stories referred to the entire event as a fraud. Brody next went on stage as a star in a show that played throughout the country for many years in a melodrama. On the Bowery purported to depict scenes from his life. He cleaned up his reputation by giving generously to charities and became, quote, an instrument of philanthropy to the unfortunates in the slums of New York. In June 1900, Brody's health started to seriously fail due to tuberculosis. In November, in desperation, he moved to better weather in San Antonio, Texas, hoping to recover. He is greatly emaciated and speaks in a whisper, and though he realizes that death is not far off, he is cheerful. When asked if he had given up jumping off things, his reply, perhaps finally reflecting on some of his fraud and the influence his fame caused others to lose their lives jumping off bridges, he said, Never jump, young man. It don't pay in the long run. There are other ways of endangering your life without doing it foolishly. Better stick to the ground as long as you can, because when you die, it's for an awful long time, and then you are planted hard in old Mother Earth. A New York man who knew him well wrote as Brody was dying. Despite all of Brody's bluffs and his put on slangy talk, he was a pretty smart individual and had as many fine points about him as a porcupine. It was claimed that Brody accumulated a fortune of $85,000, valued at $2.9 million today, before his premature death on January 31st, 1901, at the age of 39. The body was taken to Calvary Cemetery for burial. A crowd of 500 or 600 men, women, and children, attracted by curiosity, remained in the streets during the services at the house, and many of them followed the funeral cortege to the 92nd Street Ferry on its way to the cemetery. But Brody's fame lived on for decades. In 1933, George Raft played Brody in the film The Bowery. A Warner's Brothers cartoon in 1949 showed Brody being driven into jumping off the bridge by Bugs Bunny. 
This is the famous Brooklyn Bridge, 133 feet high, 1,500 feet long, contains hundreds of miles of cable. From it, Steve Brody made his sensational leap into the East River. <laughs> what in tarnation did he do that for? I'm glad you asked that, friend. It happened in 1886. Please, officer, you gotta help me. I'm flipping me lid. Everybody's turning into rabbits. What's all this about rabbits, Doc? <laughs> <laughs> and that's why Steve Brody jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge. Was Brody a fraud? He was for sure a brief, accomplished ultra-runner. But his fame and fortune drove him to find easier ways to feed his ego and accumulate wealth. Most who have carefully examined his short life, full of accomplishments, conclude that the only leap he truly made was during his On the Bowery performances, when he had dived off a platform into a mattress. Nevertheless, he was the hero of the Bowery of New York. Stay tuned for more Ultra Running Stranger Things. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. <laughs>